Well, race fans and racers, we are once again back to Yancey Shepherd's place up in Smithville, Missouri. And today we're going to be talking with Yancey Shepherd about, boy, the season's over. What should a guy do as far as deciding what to do with his motor? And what about some of the stuff and components that go into the race car? But we're going to sit down with Yancey today and have a little chat with him. So everybody enjoy yourselves and here we go. Folks, the racing season has concluded and we're up here at Yancey Shepherd's garage. I don't know exactly what to call it. I couldn't Yancey, think of it the other. Yancey's Automotive. Yancey's Automotive. And uh, thought we might talk with Yancey just a little bit about since the season's over, what are you going to do with your motor, your car, and what all? And Yancey, I guess to start off with, I want to ask you, how would a racer determine whether or not he wants to store his motor or pull his motor? And, you know, take it to a machine shop like yours and have somebody do something with it. Um, well, first to start off, I always tell, you know, because I get that question all the time, because um, the first I tell everybody to just spend at least $20 at the car wash and wash everything as good as you can <laughs> so that way you can look that race car all over mm -hmm. but as far as the motor goes um, you know usually a motor will tell you when it's ready you know we spoke of that yesterday but uh, it'll tell you because it'll start acquiring leaks that it had didn't have in the beginning and this and that and and you know if a person's real good at keeping track of laps and how many day, how many nights they have on them and how high they turned them you know. uh, but uh you know i recommend backing off the valve springs and and you know a simple leak down will show you immediately what mm. what is going on inside side the cylinder how much dirt has got inside there and so uh, on and so forth as far as valve job getting lazy and then once they back off the valves you know i just run an average spring test you know and just make sure they're all staying nice and even and all that you know but a lot of it depends on how many nights it's got on it you know mm -hmm. i usually recommend going <clears throat> on the sport mods you know i recommend 35 to 40 nights whereas a mods about 20 nights start looking and checking mm -hmm. it pretty good but you know about 30 nights they're they start wearing the valve springs i know uh -huh. but uh you know there's some guys that run them 60 nights you know i've had customers in the past that get 60 nights but they're one of those guys that are just really on top of their motors uh -huh. you know if it loses 10 pounds in a valve spring they're done they they change all of them you mm -hmm. know they just do that way and you know but usually you know a motor will tell you you know and that's why we get a lot of calls because you can tell them to check this check this and check this and uh uh but no the leak down and just testing the valve springs will tell you majority of what all you got yeah so Coming from the layman's point of view or standpoint, however you want to put that, what is a, a, a lay down test? What exactly? You mean a leak down? A leak down, I'm sorry. <laughs> leak down test. What? Um, leak down, you'll have two gauges. And actually, I got a gauge over there. It'd be real easy to show. But uh, you, get, you get a leak down tester. You know, you uh. back off the rocker arms, and this is going to shoot air into the cylinder. And you'll put it up to 100 pounds, and then whatever's bleeding by it will show you on the other gauge oh, okay. how many pounds is leaking away, like as if you had 90%, 90%, 97%, yeah. 80%, you know. And usually if customers call me, and if they're around 88 to 90, they're, they're tired. It's, you know? it's time to do it. Yeah, and because then like anymore, I started about two years ago, I started... A lot of the motors, I started leaking them right off the dyno just to know what they left with and uh -huh. that stuff. And it, it is a lot more labor, but yet at least you can, you know, the guys that are spending a lot of money on the aluminum motors mm -hmm. and all that stuff, you can say, okay, it had this when we started, and now you're down 10%. Well, mm -hmm. it's, it's going somewhere, so uh -huh. we know it's leaking. So. Uh, so for me to understand this better, and hopefully anybody that... Well, I probably did else, put the, it in layman's terms. No, yeah. no, I, I think you did. I'm, I'm just saying, I guess I'm trying to paraphrase or re, re say what you already said but what it would be then either the rings are leaking or there's a valve that's leaking yeah a valve's leaking you know and usually when a valve's leaking that means that the valve guide is starting to wear mm -hmm. and you know get the valve to float and it ain't hitting the seat properly straight and all yeah. that and or you've let the valve springs get tired too if the valve springs get tired then the motor going to valve float mm -hmm. a lot quicker and it'll actually beat the seat wider. You oh, know? Right. Today's cylinder heads are so much better than he cylinder heads of the past. They ain't as bad about it, but they still float the valves. Yeah. You know? okay. We all turn them too high. <laughs> okay, so pretty much a racer is going to know. I mean, like you say, a guy that keeps up with stuff and is on top of what what's going on with the motor, he's going to have a pretty good idea whether or not he wants to take that motor and, and yeah. rebuild it or whether he's going to store it. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, Most of them, you know, I just tell them, 
you know, because there's some people that just are not don't want to test the motor. They're afraid they're going to hurt something. And then there are the guys that will just bring them in and let us leak them and do all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And that's that's a couple hundred dollar deal, you know, for new gaskets and all the new stuff. Change the oil and all that. Mm-hmm. But that will tell them definitely yes or no, we need yeah. to rebuild this. Okay, if a guy decides that he does want to rebuild the motor and uh, say he's going to bring it into you, then what, what kind of a procedure would you go through to kind of check that out as to what it was you were going to do with that motor? As far as, well, if it gets rebuilt, then it, it's going to get new rings. It's going to get a valve job. You know, all new bearings, oil pump, time and chain. And then, you know, we always check the valve guides and all that stuff for wear. Race motors, really, you know, if the rocker arm geometry is proper or correct, they're not bad about, you know, they ain't like an everyday car. They're not bad about wearing guides, but everyday cars are better, too, mm-hmm. you know. But, uh, but no, you know, like I say, once they go to the rebuild stage, then they pretty get all the wear items mm-hmm. right. replaced. Okay. So more or less a complete motor rebuild. Exactly. exactly. Valve okay. strings, all that okay. stuff. You know, everything gets checked. And it's actually harder, I think, in my eyes, is to rebuild a motor than just build a new one. Because a new one, you know, it, everything's new. You're checking all the specs and all that stuff. And you kind of know where everything should be. Yeah. Whereas, you know, if you get a motor uh, that needs rebuilt, you know, you've got to check double of everything because of the fact that yeah. it's wearing everywhere when yeah. there's a new cylinder head you know the guides are new you know where you need to put them and uh it's just usually a lot more labor intensive yeah. to redo a motor to yeah. me yeah it's so it, i guess when i asked that question i was having some brain fade <laughs> but it would be not like if you took your family car in and say you had one valve that was bad they would probably just replace that one part exactly. where in race application you you're going one. for the whole thing yeah if you got one bad they're all bad okay you know, so like I, as far as pistons and any more as far as crankshafts or anything if they're i mean not that a crank would be bad unless we magnaflux it and it yeah. was busted or something uh, but uh usually i don't really find them crack they usually crack on their own then you get them you yeah. know? <laughs> but uh but no i usually don't you know, you, you can bring in the flat tap and stuff, and, you know, you'll have a low trying. It ain't going flat. It's or It ain't flat. It's just trying to go flat. Mm-hmm. And you caught it before. You know, that happens a lot. So, yeah. you know, you get a new camshaft, new lifters. And that also, too, when you knock the lobe off, that has a lot to do. Valve springs play a yeah. big part in race engines. Okay. If the guy is going to store the motor, which... Like I say, the biggest investment probably in the whole car, you're talking about the motor. Um, what are some of the things that a guy really needs to do? I mean, boy, you're the motor builder and the machinist of anybody ought to know because you see all these problems as they come in later on. But what is it that he really needs to do now to store that motor so that Come next spring when he gets ready to get that thing out there, it's not going to be the first night and whoops, look what happened here. Exactly. What's that, going on? That's happened in the past. For one, I recommend getting all the water out or, or, or you know, pull the block drains and all that stuff because a freezing, you know, whether that car's going to uh, set out in the cold, mm-hmm. you know, because some people just can't put them inside. But uh, I usually tell everybody, you know, once again, the leak down test, you know, because that'll tell you about everything. But everything checks out okay. You leave all the rock and well change the oil first you know because you can leave that oil in there but the minute you start up in the spring all the contaminants in the oil will separate from the oil Mm -hmm. and yet they're still in the motor and people fire that up and they're separated and you'll get a big gulp of contaminants you know sludge and and it's hard to believe in a race motor how much you know extra fuel and just everything will get inside the oil and dust yeah dirt dust (laughs) dirt and, and people don't think that but they're race engines you know that's what they're you know, we sit there and breathe the stuff in. They're doing the same thing. Say. No matter how good an air filter we got, it's going to get in there. But, uh, you know, I usually tell people to just, uh, you know, if all the leak down tests are okay, change the oil, run it a little bit just to get that mm-hmm. new oil circulating in there so you ain't got no contaminants on the mm-hmm. bearings. And then uh, turn around and spray WD-40 in the cylinders and uh, back the rockers off. And, yeah. you know, don't turn it over because then you're going to open up other valves. But, yeah. but, you know, just 
pretty much give her a good once over yeah. see if there's any leaks anything going on and uh, other than that it should be fine it's just you know make sure there's no water in it yeah. or there's antifreeze in it and change that oil and get the valves backed off okay since we're kind of, we're we're in the we're under the hood let's say what about the carburetor and the fuel system? What what would a person want to do with that? I mean, um, you know, my lawnmower, I put stabili- stabilizer or whatever that in there, and oh, that helps that. But what, what race about it? Ga- race gas does have a certain life to it. It's hard to tell when, but I, me, myself, I always tell my customers, just drain that cell, run the car out of fuel, and leave it, you know, especially if it's alcohol. Um, whereas, you know, when you get opinions on that with oh if you drain it all out the fuel line's going to crack and this I, uh-huh. i'm not a believer in that i just tell them to change the filter but then uh, i always recommend pulling the carburetor apart pull the bowls off of it see if it's dirty see if it needs an overhaul uh-huh. or anything but uh and then spray wd-40 inside there so that stuff won't dry out and corrode and uh, uh you know it's just a good time you know keep spray wd-40 all over just to yeah. keep that thing from collecting dust and dirt and and leaving the old fuel inside it because then come springtime that thing will look like a sprinkler yeah it'll just leak and yeah <laughs> holes will be loose and, and it's hard to believe that mother nature will do that to yeah. them but they will you uh-huh. know well, a lot of people wait till the last minute so springtime we're usually ordering 25 carb kits and rebuilding <laughs> carburetors but you know, and it's just gaskets and stuff. Yeah. But, you know, if people play that little bit of time, because it's only time if they play, if they do just what they're supposed to do, that stuff will last a long time. Yeah. Okay, since we're still under the hood, let's talk about air breathers. It would Is this the time to get rid of that old air breather? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I'm sure it's not something that you're going to want to keep around because it's probably served its purpose yeah. and it's probably time to move on to another one. I'm a big fan of just using a Wix air filter. They're relatively inexpensive. I always tell my customers change them every night because it might. Oh look really? Clean. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah, because they're they're so so cheap to collect dust, and they'll lose so much horsepower if they get dirty. Mm-hmm. That if they keep that air filter fresh, you know, it's going to stay fresh as far as c- collecting particles and everything mm-hmm. out of the air, and you know the seal stays soft and everything. You know that thing. You take it through the car wash. You take it through everything. Well, minute you hit it with the car wash, mm-hmm. that dust turns to mud, and then it uh-huh. really clogs up, and they don't realize it. Uh-huh. You know? Some people put a carb cap on it or stuff, but uh-huh. but I just recommend because that is the cheapest way to keep dirt out of your motor every week. Every I week. am, but you know, it just seems so cheap to do. How it. much are we talk about for every week? What would one cost uh, a week? They cost me. I order them like fifty at a time, and they cost me about five bucks. Five bucks. Yeah. Okay. And and I can sell them for five. I do just to my yeah. best customers and stuff, just so they put a new one yeah. on. You know, mm-hmm. just a standard air filter. You know, they're made by Wix. But yeah. Anyway, uh, as far as the fuel system goes, uh, you know if. If your part's starting to see your pump get a little wet, the diaphragm could be getting lazy mm-hmm. in it. I recommend just buy a rebuild kit or just get a new one because that's that's what's making the power. You know, uh-huh. it's got to have fuel to make power. And if uh, if people, you know, I don't know. There's ten different ways to go about the same result, but I just recommend taking the whole thing apart and the whole fuel system apart. Just make sure there's nothing yeah. in it and get all the fuel out of it, and then it'll be perfectly fine in spring. Okay. What about hoses? Radiator. Uh, radiator hoses. Yeah. Oh, if you run. Is the that something you replace I, every? Yeah, I've never owned a race car because I'm I'm trying to think. Wow, uh, what would I want to do? Um, you know, if they get mushy, that's kind of a hard hard thing to say. Street stocks, yeah, because those things are notorious for running hot some of the times. You know, uh-huh. so I definitely replace the radiator and the hoses because you know, once you get a radiator hot so many times, mm-hmm. you wash it so many times, the fins get laid over, and and they start calling later in the year and saying, oh, my motor's running hot. Well, for one, you're middle of august and it's 110 degrees out or two you know they've just washed it so many times and the tubes in the radiator are made out of aluminum well they get hot and cold hot and cold they'll finally just close up and won't oh really water. okay then you throw a new radiator and then all of a sudden your stuff's fixed and you're thinking well, well that old radiator was junk well no uh-huh. it's just because it's been through so many heat cycles uh-huh. that it's just shrunk back down and it just won't flow no water all right okay now i think that pretty well covers the hood can you talk anything about power steering or <laughs> well, power steering, I know that's that's uh, brake you know, system, you know stuff you know, like the that. The braking system, I just recommend telling people to you know just change the fluid in it, you know, and watch out. You now know. you want to do that in the winter when you're doing yeah. this maintenance thing, but yeah, you know the just thing because you know a, a pint of brake fluid is two dollars, you know, uh-huh. and the braking on a dirt car, a pavement car, anything gets so hot. Yeah. That it breaks down just like oil does, you know. I actually went to school on all the additives and everything, but uh, they, uh, 
you know, they just rec- people don't understand that they really need to change their brake fluid too, as well as you know, uh-huh. just like brake pads. You know, uh-huh. none of us are none of us do it. You know, <laughs> but it seems like if we got a good pedal, that we we think we're fine. Everything's you know? fine. But but that plays a big role in it. You know, yeah. because if the brake fluid breaks down and and it starts separating, it's just like oil. It's it's going to not work yeah. and do its now is that hydraulic system. Is that know? from the heating and cooling yeah. where the brake fluid is the the well, I don't know what you want to call it, not necessarily the chemical makeup, but it's yeah. it's something's going to change. Yeah, it's going to change and I, and I don't remember what kind of process they calls it called it when brake fluid goes through a certain cycle yeah. but it's just like anything else you change your training fluid you change your, yeah. you know why people never change the brake fluid but it, we all are guilty of it and i am too you know yeah. if the brake pedal is hard we think we got a good one and yeah. it's hard to believe <laughs> yeah. how, how big of a difference it will make yeah. same thing with power steering no i mean or is it getting uh, get get as hot I don't know. Never done that much. No, I never really it. messed with that too much. It seems like if it starts leaking, I'll change it. But uh-huh. I just knock on wood. I've never really messed. Yeah. You know, it's a good subject because I've never really thought about. <laughs> I've never really thought about really changing the power steering fluid. Cause, yeah. Like I say, it is oil based also. Yeah. Uh, what about? Uh, let's move on further back behind the motor just a little, boys. And and what about the transmission? Are we going to do anything with that? Um, well, if it's a bird or a brand or a falcon, they'll kind of tell you when they're getting tired. You know, you'll change the oil in it and you see little pieces from the clutch material and uh-huh. stuff. Whereas, like, uh, you know, you can usually tell when the clutch is getting bent on those, the pedal will be down by the floor. Whereas a street stock, you know, I'd recommend at least replacing the face every time. Mm hmm. The face plate. Yeah, see, I think we were talking about power steering. Uh, I, uh, Appreciate you doing this here in the middle of your business day. Oh, I know you got customers coming in and out, but I appreciate you taking your time to sit down with us. But I think we were talking about power steering. Yeah, we were talking about power steering and transmissions, and thanks for letting me do this, because this might answer a lot of questions and, and knock on wood, maybe a few <laughs> phone calls. But, you know, everybody should know to do it, and uh, I don't usually have a lot of time to help people with that, you know, mm-hmm. because I'm busy with other things. But um, as far as transmissions go... It's so relatively inexpensive on a Burton and a Brin to rebuild those. Plus, like a street stock and everything, um, you know, they those guys are usually pretty inept as far as knowing when to rebuild and all that stuff because their three speeds will jump out of gear. Uh-huh. But uh, as far as the paraglides, a different, you know, some guys are running the paraglides with no torque conversion and sport mods. I would 100% tell them to rebuild the transmission over the winter uh-huh. because they're they're like Bouchard charged seven to eight hundred for. A, complete brand new one ready to go uh-huh. so i don't know what their rebuild program but i know a few people here in town that rebuild them and do a great job at it so you know just find your local guy that does it i don't mm-hmm. know who to recommend i know a couple guys but i don't really yeah. want to recommend them because i don't i don't know if they want me to <laughs> you know, so, you know, if they told me to, but no. well if you recommended one then probably somebody else would be upset exactly. because you didn't say something so yeah it's a catch-22 yeah you you're know? best to leave it alone yeah but uh, as far as that, you know, I, I recommend always changing you don't joints over the winter, always uh, changing rear gears. That's what I was getting ready to ask you about, you the drive shaft. Just, they take a punishment. Oh, yeah. I mean, they take a literal beating, and we've all seen drive shafts on the racetrack. And uh, But, no, definitely replace the U-joints. You know, take the rear end out, and, and you know, if you want to, I charge 50 bucks to knock one apart. I don't really want to do a bunch of them, but you know, I, there's a lot, a lot of people in this town that knows how to do them. But mm-hmm. you know, that's the first thing. If a transmission, if a rear end or a transmission fails, it tears up everything, and as well yeah. as it can hurt you. Yeah, you know, well, if drive shaft comes through the floor, boy, you look out. I mean, it, it'll yeah. hurt you bad. I was just up at I-35 and happened to have a um, in-car camera. I think it was in Peeler's car, I believe. Blake or Jim? Blake's. Uh-huh. And just happened to be the race i had the in-car camera and his yoke broke i believe uh-huh. it was yep and caught a guy right behind him and uh nose went through his yep. yeah broke his broke nose and, his helmet and yeah yeah i remember so that. yeah you're right man there's uh-huh. some bad stuff I can mean, happen it, there it's you know i mean we all do all the best we, you know especially them as far as car builders and stuff everybody does as much as they can for safety but yet they gripe about new safety rules mm-hmm. but that's something you always got to watch for is yeah. safety you okay know, and, we all don't want to do it, but we do, yeah. you know. So you, you, you say then, okay, U-joints on the drive shaft, and then uh, what about the rear end? Well, the can rear you, end, do like, you rebuild that, replace the gears? Or oh, what? you can. You know, you can, but a lot of times... Is that a necessity the, every every year? No, definitely the grease change. You know, but a lot of racers change the grease periodically because they're changing gears, you mm-hmm. know. But a rear end will usually tell you, take the, the gear grease out of it, and it'll be metallic-y looking mm-hmm. or something, and uh, uh, you'll find a piece of a tooth laying in there, and it'll run just fine with yeah. that tooth broke off, but 
it will definitely get you later on down the road so you have to address that issue um, yeah. but no you know just change the fluids and mm -hmm. just that's why I, at step one is always and when I would, Larry Shaw, his boy Kevin, grilled that in my head. He goes, if you ever want to be a good racer, you must have a clean race car. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, you got to represent your race car just as well as you do yourself. Yeah. And uh, he said, you know, you keep that race car clean, you will find cracks and leaks and this and that. And you will be yeah. the guy, the guy with the most maintenance and doing the most maintenance in his, at his house will be the one that will finish, yeah. usually finishes first. You yeah. know? I'm trying to remember, I think it's Brian Brown. I believe I've heard him say it a couple of times, and I can't remember whether it was his grandpa or who it was that was telling him. But he said, you know, most of the races are one in the garage. Exactly. And exactly, like you say, the maintenance thing is such a big deal, and I hope that's what we're kind of getting that's across what, here yeah, today. That's what we're trying to prove or kind of bring up and and grill into people's heads and stuff, <laughs> you know, because I actually started out racing drag racing you know and uh and drag racing you know that car never really gets dirty or hit mm -hmm. or nothing like that but you know you spend so much time on a drag race car cleaning it because you think you know oh well, what if i break this or what if i break that i'm going at such a high rate of speed but yet you're out there for three times the amount of time uh -huh. in a circle track car <laughs> but you'll see circle track racers not spend as much time on their car and and some of them are very very good at it but mm. there's some of them that slack a little bit and that's okay i'm guilty of it too uh, but, but you know just maintenance is is the key to winning no okay i think we're back to the rear end we okay. got that far uh anything about shocks i mean uh um, do they I, need to be tested or anything I, I recommend sending the shocks and have them dynoed, but that that ain't really a big deal as long as you remember in your head you know how that shock somewhat felt mm -hmm. before but it's really tough to notice when a shock is going lazy real good racers you know can, yeah. can know all oh, the right rear is doing this or yeah. right left front or something but i reckon i recommend you know there's a lot of people around that's got a shock dyno i recommend getting them dynoed just so you know what you got uh -huh. i know this sounds like a lot of maintenance and a lot of period a lot of stuff to do but it's all a lot of stuff that don't cost a lot of money and will save you so much money in the long run in the long you know, run it yeah. might, you might be that winning car the first night out because you were ready in springtime uh -huh. exactly okay i think we're down to the chassis i think uh wheel bearings uh yeah wheel uh, bearings. Break, I know we didn't really talk about that but no. I, there again i don't race how often do you replace wheel bearings i never really do never I, do I, no i because a wheel bearing like I say it's another one that it'll, it'll look perfect and if it's going to fail it's just going to fail uh -huh. i mean like that i i have a young son that helps me so he keeps me motivated and i didn't race much last year but uh but my young son kept me and we just would inspect all that stuff uh -huh. you know that's get once again clean the car really good look you know and you'll know because it'll have a little wiggle uh -huh. or something to it that's something you know that's easy enough to check and uh oh what was i going to say um like modifieds in the pull bars you know it's so that's that's the whole traction point of a race car on a modified pull, pull bar or lift arm uh -huh. and uh, if a person just takes that apart and gets all the grease from throughout the year that's been packed in that thing you know because uh -huh. you just reach under there and grease it or wd-40 it make sure it's loose but you need mm -hmm. to get in there and clean all that out mm -hmm. and you know check all your heims because heims you know they'll just start wearing out too and uh like i said it's, it's just general maintenance but if that car is clean, and then I recommend taking like a solvent, if it's powder coated, some kind of easy solvent, mm -hmm. whack, wiping down the whole chassis, every place the weld is, and it will show. Uh, you know, you will sit there and show. You see a crack or yeah. whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just preventative maintenance, because that could be the one to bite you in the, in the springtime, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And it's simple to fix over the winter. It gives you something to do, get all your buddies around and, <laughs> and stuff. But uh, yeah, that, that's what I always recommend. Yeah. Boy, it sounds like it's uh, quite an off season thing to. Uh, to go through and you know it's funny but uh i bet you there are probably a few racers out there already that have already got it all done probably. <laughs> there's guys that are i mean i've had lots of customers they they always set dates you know they're going to uh -huh. have car done by here and this and that and uh you know or a lot of guys i know they want their motor back and they want everything in line by christmas that's their date really that they want to have that car ready so you know they've already spent all the money so they got all <laughs> the following left of the winter and the uh, time to save their money t to get ready to go to be prepared and yeah. those are the guys that are pretty darn on top of things and they do they're very successful at it yeah you know i actually i'm actually the type of person i learn a lot from them because i think they're over maintenancing and yeah. and they actually but they're the ones in the winter circle a lot of times yeah so um i suppose if a racer was gonna 
leave the car pretty much together, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, he's going to want to store it in a certain way. What would that be? Uh, up in the air. I, I always recommend, you know, it takes all the tension off everything as far as the springs and the shocks and, mm -hmm. and all that stuff. And you pretty much need it up in the air to really crawl around that car. So I just, and most racers do, you know, so that way they can take all the wheels and tires off because mm -hmm. they're going to hang that new body or re-letter mm -hmm. or whatever they're going to do. But I always recommend to jack the car up as high as you can get that thing so uh, you can really get a good look of everything. Yeah. You know, go. I always recommend going through all the wiring and just at the connectors just pull them make sure nothing's yeah. going to lose because those poor old cars take a beating oh, yeah. i mean they it's a wonder some of them stay together you know especially yeah. springtime when the racetrack's heavy and yeah. rough and and carrying on it it's a wonder that some of them even stay together so it, it, it truly is i just recently i think when i was down at moverley which is the first time i'd been down there in about eight years but i actually had my car out on the track and i was just amazed uh -huh. <laughs> how rough it actually how is. rough it actually is i mean i i know uh, gee, uh, most promoters, I think, anymore really love to use the sheep's foot. I know. And, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that, but they don't understand when they sheep's foot it how when a race car enters the corner, you know, if you drive your everyday car around there, how that racetrack just feels like you're just, going over yeah. little bitty speed bumps. Well, yeah. that's why we're all buying these high dollar shocks and everything. And I'm not a promoter, so I don't know how to finish a racetrack, but uh, they're, it's so tough to keep that tire on the ground when you're going over little uh, yeah, vehicles. But yeah. It's like a washboard. Exactly. You see people and everybody do. knows how a washboard is when you drive over that. Yeah, but you see people make it work over that. But yeah, just just think about all the components in that race car shaking and yeah. carrying on, and and those things live through that. Yeah. You know, it's it's kind of amazing sometimes. You know, of how fast. You know, and we're going 100 mile an hour probably on the on that kind of stuff. Especially at Lakeside. Yeah. Thing, yeah. Oh, well, Lakeside, yes. But uh, it's it's kind of cool to think about. Yeah. It's a challenge. Yeah. Okay. Now, we've pretty well covered the car. Yeah, we have. <laughs> now we're going to talk a little bit about the guy that drives it. Um, oh, no. <laughs> I thought I would bring this up because um, uh, just this year uh, I've had the opportunity to actually race some RC with Jake Richards, and I think I relayed to you the other day the story about Jake was telling me about he might lose 10 pounds during a 25-lap race or during the course of an evening. Uh -huh. um, how tired you actually are when you get out of the car after a 25 lap uh, a main um, and we were talking about your case in particular about how normally you are about 180 pounder yeah. and this year you have kind of blossomed a little yeah, because, mainly because of the racing because i didn't race this year and that usually just kept me slimmer uh -huh. you know or, or in shape better you know i think i'm in shape because i'm always walking around here and doing stuff but but wow i've really really <laughs> lost it and you see a lot of older drivers a perfect example is rick Beebe. whenever he uh, came back to racing dirt and everything uh -huh. like three or four years ago it took rick a uh, long time you know i think he was going to the gym and doing build up stuff. his endurance yes you know he just would get so tired you know especially when he first started he had bought a Hughes car from uh -huh. me and he just told me he said I don't have enough driver for the race car yet and I just <laughs> laughed about it but, but you know Rick was a little older but you know mm -hmm. he, I could just sit there and watch him just get in yeah. great shape you know and and you see these guys come in here and and I, I can't say nothing I'm guilty of it because I'll think I'm in great shape and uh -huh. like you said Jake you'll catch yourself holding your breath uh -huh. he's exactly right I'd never really thought about it until you said that yesterday but it's true you will get so wrapped up so all of us sit around and eat our Thanksgiving and our turkeys <laughs> and our candies and stuff and, uh, and it's terrible you know usually the first guy yeah. I, and I've heard like Tim Carrick goes to the gym quite often yeah. and everything, but you know Tim he's just always fast you know mm -hmm. I mean he's so he's got to do some kind of program to yeah. keep himself in shape. And, and I'm not really the best person to be asking that. <laughs> the question you're saying. But, but it is. You know, yeah. the guys, you'll see them shine at the beginning of the year. The guys that went out and did the workouts or run or something. Yeah. Like John O'Neill was always big about, you know, keeping himself in shape. And I always said I was going to go with him, but I never really made it. Yeah. With him. But, you know, well, we'd... I would think in the middle of the summer when that heat really comes on uh -huh. is when that would be another important. Well, I think I relayed to you. I interviewed Jason Myers. Uh -huh. Uh, World of Outlaw champion again for the second year and uh, that was one of the things that he told me was he had an off season workout program that he he went through and he felt like it really helped him when they got into the heat of the summer but another uh, thing I'd like to relate to everybody was I was at Valley this year for one of the sprint car races down there and this young man who I, I I'm sure wasn't over 21 which we I think most people still think hey you know a 21 year old kid still in pretty good shape Went out, 
led the race that had opened up probably a straightaway lead. Yellow flag comes out, and all of a sudden it's like he didn't have the speed or anything that he had in nearly part of the race. I interviewed him after the race, or I went down and talked to him, and he says, I got tired. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, I didn't think race car drivers ever got tired. No, I, I would have thought your, that, but. your adrenaline would be flowing so much that it would just you would just go. <laughs> Uh -huh. Well, a perfect example, a friend of mine, he went and ran the ARCA race out there, and, you know, I, I just had to ask him when he got out of the car, I said, you know, I know these things are probably easier than a dirt car and everything, and he goes, yeah, you got to fight them, but that's why you only see dirt cars running 25 or, you know, sometimes uh, late models, 50, Yeah. but uh, you see them running that, whereas a pavement car, they can do it, well, I think it's just the stress on the body, mm -hmm. you know, it's just the up and down and the braking and mm -hmm. and just everything about it and uh it it's just tough to say what is the best program to do i mean of course running is going to be your best deal but i and that's opinion, who knows that's yeah. opinions you know yeah. but uh yeah it is funny how you see people and i've been guilty of it too just get darn tired yeah you know they those cars you know especially if you got a tight car or something it always seems like your your mind's so stressed because you know it's tight and, yeah. and you know and you you're kind of manhandling the thing and you do you just kind of hold your breath and hang on you know? <laughs> I, I i'm just going to ask this question because i just happened to think of it do you know or have you heard of any of the drivers that actually do any of these video games i mean do you think or have you ever done it would that keep any of your i don't know senses sharper I, i've seen a lot of the the dirt racers and, and customers of mine they'll go out and all of them will get together and go out to that uh nascar or that uh, mm -hmm. that cart place out there in olathe and uh it's in olathe i think i think so yeah uh -huh. but anyway i know they'll all get together because they have like winter leagues and stuff uh -huh. like that and i know those guys get big into that and then of course you know they all get souped up for the chili bowl i know oh, I, yeah. I have quite a few guys that go to that deal but uh but uh as far as playing the video games i i never they might be embarrassed to tell me that <laughs> you know that their son's whipping their butt or, or you yeah. know, i know my i know my son sure can he's way better at those yeah. games than me but but yeah that would be something to keep your mind straight yeah. you know as as far you know because it's somewhat of a mental game anyway yeah. you know so. <laughs> well okay yancy I, I thoroughly have enjoyed this and i certainly hope some of you folks out there fans or racers have enjoyed uh, being able to sit down with yancy and talk about now that the season's over, some of the decisions you might be wanting to make as far as do I keep the motor, do I rebuild it, what do I need to replace, what am I going to do, and uh, I hope, as Yancey says, we've answered some of these questions and it'll save a phone call, because yeah. <laughs> I know I can look around, as you can see, and I know you've got a lot of stuff going on, and I'm sure that phone, I mean, it can be your... Uh, Best what do you want, your best friend or your worst enemy, as they say? Exactly. So we could do this. Oh, I forgot a tear. Yeah. So we could do this. I actually just turned the thing off. I hate being that way, but, you know, it's just sometimes you just got to do something. Yeah. So I didn't want to be interrupted, but, uh, yeah. no, it is. Uh, you're, you know, hopefully all everybody realizes that, you know, all the engine builders are there to help you, but you got to, yeah. you know, they got to do their thing. They got a business to run to. Yeah. yeah. Yep. But once again, Yancey, man, I really do appreciate your time, and I have thoroughly enjoyed it, and I hope you folks have out, to, out there too. And that's going to wrap it up for another Shop Talk Tech Talk, we're yep. going to call this. So, Yancey, thanks a lot, buddy. Thank you. Mm -hmm.